reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to supply. Reach out. Tonight, let's take our Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to Psalm 111. Psalm 111, God's Marvelous Works. This psalm praises God for his marvelous works, and we see that God is worthy to be praised. God's works are marvelous, and he is to be feared and obeyed. The lesson, I think, might come from Psalm 98, verse 1. Sing to the Lord a new song for he has done marvelous things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you all the glory and honor. We ask that the power of the Holy Spirit would come upon us as we read your word, speak your word, teach your word to all, and may all be filled with the Holy Spirit that are here and that are listening. Come Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. Psalm 111. Remember now, all these psalms are songs. That's what a psalm is, a song. And I want to have Kelly read the whole song, or Psalm, verses 1 through 10. Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart, in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious, and His righteousness endures forever. He has made His wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given food to those who fear him. He will never be mindful of his covenant. He has declared to his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are verity and justice. All his precepts, precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Psalm 111, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And that's what it means in any language. Hallelujah. And here we see that in the very first verse, God is worthy to be praised. Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. God is worthy of praise, he's deserving of praise. Uh, one of the uh, very popular songs right now on K-Love is uh, Who Am I Not to Worship God? Uh, he has made the heavens, the earth, the stars do not shine unless he tells them to. And who am I not to worship God? The height of ego and pride is to think, I don't need to praise God. He's worthy of it, he deserves it. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. And I will praise the Lord doesn't mean that necessarily that I feel like it. Sometimes I don't feel like it. This is not a matter of, of if you feel like it, it's a matter of will, I will do it. I will do it because God deserves it. And uh, sometimes he calls it a sacrifice of praise. And a sacrifice means you don't always feel like it, but that's when it's especially good, when you will sacrifice and say, I will praise you, Lord, because you are worthy. And I'm not going to do it just with lip service, but notice that with my whole heart. I think it's important to really do it with our whole heart. Now, don't be confused about repetition. There's nothing wrong with repetition so long as it's not vain repetition. You can say, praise the Lord. Our old friend Don Gossett on his radio program used to say, praise the Lord 10 times. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And he would do it 10 times. You could do it 100 times. As long as you mean it with your whole heart, it's beautiful. You can say it one time, and if you don't mean it, it's not beautiful. So you need to do it with your whole heart. So I will indicates it's not a question of whether I feel like it. It's a command to myself. Self, praise the Lord. God needs my praise, not that he is incomplete, but he needs it so that he can work in my life to give me the peace and the joy because scripture tells us he inhabits the praises of his people. If you want God to draw near, you praise him. Show them how to praise the Lord, Jerry. As the praises go up, 
the blessings will come down. And you praise the Lord in <coughs> any way that you feel to do it in your heart. And it can be done by singing, it can be done by thinking, just by admiring the, the world around you. Get up in the morning and look at the creation, uh, look at a little puppy dog that's licking your face and needs to go out. Uh, it can be many different ways to how about if celebrate you, How it. about when you go home tonight, you just say, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. Praise the Lord. That's right. Have you ever done that? Yeah. Oh, no. Okay. So um, it gets your mind off yourself, and it helps you. And then all of a sudden... You're praising the Lord, and something happens. I don't know what it is. Who was the guy that says praise 10 times? Don Gossip. We just talked about yeah, him. Yeah, and he would do that every day. And um, I mean, I don't do that every day, but when I do, boy, I do feel a difference. I got to just tell you this. It, this. I always use my dumb stories, but they're truthful. I can always tell you they're truthful. When I was younger, and I remember getting saved, and I remember thinking, this is the epitome of pride. You know, I'm going to say something funny. I would say... Why do I got to praise the Lord? Why does God want me to praise him? It's just, he just wants praise. Why would he want praise? Why should I praise the Lord? I used to think these things in my head when I was first saved. And I would get these weird thoughts, like where did they come from? And now I know they were not. That was pride. And also the devil, right? He speaks to you. And he tries to put those bad things. You don't know how to praise the Lord. Why does he want you to praise the Lord? Well, when we praise the Lord... We are delivered from so many things. Not only that, we're delivered from pride. That's right. So we are, first of all, to praise God because he's deserving of it. He exists, and who am I not to worship him? I love that. that Secondly, uh, as I praise him, it blesses me, and I feel his presence nearly in my heart, near my heart. But thirdly, he goes on to say, praise him in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. So when you praise him in public, now you're blessing others. And so you're blessing God, you're blessing yourself, you're blessing others. Praise is going to always be a blessing. And if you don't feel like it, just get started, as Kelly said. Um, I hate to say fake praise, but there's an old saying, fake it until you make it. Yeah. Sometimes you have to just kind of uh, jumpstart it and uh, kind of prime the pump, uh, the well, so to speak, and get it going. Praise the Lord. Uh, and... Um, I like to praise the Lord usually in tongues. It's easier for me than in English, but uh, sometimes I'll do it in English as well or go back and forth or sing and speak. But in the first minute or two, it might be a little bit dry, maybe five minutes, but after about five minutes, I'm going. And then it's hard to stop. Then it's very hard to stop the praise. And do it in the congregation with others and encourage them as well. And you can do it in a workplace. You might just say pray. I remember I, I went to church with... This church I used to go to years ago, everybody in the church, the minute, oh, praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise God. Oh, praise the Lord. I used to hear it all the time. I think I brought that up and I thought to myself, can they say anything else but praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. But I look back on those people. They were really loving the Lord. They were really holy. The mm -hmm. Lord has really mm -hmm. showed me. And, you know, I'm, I'm working on that more like in the public, out in the square, wherever we are. We can say praise the Lord. Something good happens. Something works out at work. You got the message. You did a good class. You did a good grit. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let other people hear you. We're adding salt into the world. Everybody else is adding junk. Let's add our blessings into the That's world. That's right. And you don't need to be creative in terms of a lot of language. You're right, Kelly. You can just say, uh, just say hallelujah, which is praise the Lord. Praise you can just Lord. say hallelujah, say it all day long, as long as it's from your heart. The important thing is that you're blessing God, and you're blessing him because of his wonderful works. Verse 2 opens up this discussion of the works that are marvelous. He says in verse 2, the works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. Uh, study the works of God. I love testimonies because the testimonies are evidence of God's work. As you hear someone giving a testimony, it's the work of God. I've never heard a bad testimony. As long as it's centered on God, uh, that testimony is a blessing. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. You might also say, Lord, I'm a little bit cavalier in terms of my studies, I get up in the morning and I say, oh, smells good, green grass, green trees, nice sunshine, hello, goodbye. Help me to study it. Help me to think about this. Let me look at the sun. Let me look at the stars. 
Um, this morning we got in early, it was an early morning as Kelly is on her another job that she has as a nurse educator. Uh, Albany Med starts at seven, so we had to be here about six to get everybody and all the dogs in shape. And uh, we woke the birds up. Uh, the, the birds like to nest in the little tree outside the window. I hate getting up early. And, and we, we got them, and so all the dogs were fascinated by the fact that the birds were just getting up. And I began to study the creation of God, a new day, and dogs are up, and birds are getting up, and I've got to get up. And um, so study the works of God. Think about how good he is and about his creation. Don't, don't take things for granted. Um, and uh, he says his work is honorable and it's glorious and his righteousness endures forever. forever. Oh, it's always going to be there. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. He wants for us to remember them. Amen. In the Jewish tradition, especially in their celebration of Passover, their Seder meal, uh, they will celebrate and remember how God delivered them from bondage in Egypt. They'll go through the details of the miracles that uh, were performed by Moses and Aaron. And uh, there's an awful lot in Scripture about Israel being told to remember what God has done. And so we don't look back with regret. We don't look back in anger and fear. We look back to remember what God has done. And then we look forward with faith to what God's going to do tomorrow. If he delivered you before, he can deliver you again. That's right. Right? He can keep delivering us. I remember one time when I was so despondent, I couldn't hold my head up. I couldn't say anything. And someone said, say Jesus. And I fell out of my bed on my knees because I didn't even have the strength. And I just kept saying, Jesus, Jesus. There's times that life has get that bad. That's right. Right. But God got me through it. And I look back and I'm like, I hear people today, they get depressed. And I'm like, wow, God really delivered me. God is so good. Right. So yeah. good. He's the answer to everything. Everything is getting so complicated now. Uh, whether you, if you go to an orthopedic surgeon, once I had broken one part of my body, I'd almost forgotten what it was. I guess it was the, it was the elbow. And I smashed it in hundreds of pieces and um, took a bad fall on the, uh, the, the pavement out there on the road. And uh, I went over to one of the orthopedic uh, places and they sent a doctor up and, uh, uh, oh, it's the elbow, I don't do elbows. Uh, he, does, he does another part of the body. So I had to get somebody else. They're all, all specialists and that's fine. Um, but I like uh, one-stop shopping. Remember the old general stores where you went in and got everything you wanted in one store? Well, Jesus is one-stop shopping. He will take care of any need that you have. And Kelly and I and you have the easiest job in the world. No matter what the problem is, Jesus. He's the one who will solve the problem. Always mention him. And so um, he's gracious. Oh, he, verse 4 says, the Lord is gracious and he's full of compassion. What does gracious mean? He doesn't give you what you deserve. Thank God for that. What, what do our sins require of us? What's the penalty for Death. sin? He doesn't give that to us. He gives us life. He gives us, he took our, our death for himself and he gave us his life and his righteousness. And so he's gracious and he's full of compassion. And he wants for that to be flowing through my life to you. I'm not to be judgmental. I'm not to be critical. I'm not to be condescending and arrogant and, uh, and uh, short-tempered. And there's so we much of that. We, we struggle with it. We all do. Oh. We so all do. much of that. Lord, I want your grace and I want your compassion. Because you can preach all day long about the Lord, but if you don't demonstrate it with the life of Christ flowing through your life, your, your words are not going to mean anything at all. Well, he has given food to those who fear him. What kind of food are we talking about? Everything. Everything. Yeah, it's, so we can spiritualize it and we will, but how many of you ate today? Unless you were fasting, you had a chance to eat. And uh, my first meal was not very good. I went over to the corner uh, Valero station and got my coffee and got my roll. And it seemed a little bit tough. Why did and he the, do the, that? the fellow was very honorable and he said, that uh, roll was from yesterday, it's free. I thought, Stop oh, I'll, it. I'll get Did a you eat it? I, I, I tried a couple of bites. I thought, I'll get a free meal out of the deal. I said, this is ridiculous. I, said, I forget that, so I, I trashed it. But other than that, I've had a good day as far as physical food. I love to eat. How many of you love to eat? 
You know, unless you're dead, you're, you love to eat, sure. So he gives us food. Thank God for that. Pray for those that don't have enough food. So much of the world is challenged by that now. They have, they have food shortage. But thank you for the food that I have. Spiritual food. He's got, he gives us his word. He gives us his Holy Spirit. Gives us the name of Jesus. How about the food of fellowship? Do you have friends? You're all talking to, to people around you. They're important to you. Uh, the food of uh, friendship. How about the food of uh, enough money to, to meet your needs? The food of a job and employment and a sense of value there. The, just the list goes on. Food is just any form of sustenance. And it's all because of Jesus, the bread of life. He said he is the bread of life. Lord, you're my food. You're what, food is what you feed on to be nourished. Jesus is your food. He's the one that will nourish you. He'll keep you strong. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. Well, in the Old Testament, that covenant was with Moses, wasn't it, on the Ten Commandments? And um, today, the covenant's in the blood of Jesus. He remembers his covenant. Lord, you promised that you would forgive my sins. You promised to give me eternal life. You promised that you'd never leave me nor forsake me. It's in the covenant. It's a contract. You have a contract with God. He has declared to his people in the power of his works, in giving them the heritage of the nations. He's talking about Israel here, but it also applies to all who are believers, including us. He has declared to his people the power of his works. He wants you to know the power of his works. He is omnipotent, all-powerful. There is nothing he cannot do. And he is going to give them the heritage or the inheritance of the nations. And this is going to happen for Israel. It's not happening right now. Israel is struggling, as you know, even in its very existence. But in the millennium, when the Lord reigns in Israel, and we're going to be down here on earth in the millennium, he is going to be sitting right in Jerusalem on his throne in the temple, and he is going to rule the world through the nation of Israel. The disciples are going to be there to So we don't throw Israel out of the... You know, people want to just throw Israel out. No. They don't understand. Have you met people like that? It's a very important point you raise. What is God's attitude towards Israel now? My personal opinion is God loves Israel. He loves Ukraine. He loves Ireland. He sure. loves all nations. Sure. In the Old Testament, he focused in on Israel as his special people. He gave them his word. He gave them his son. And he gave them particular blessings and a revelation of himself. When they rejected his son, when Stephen, the first Christian martyr, testified on how they had always resisted God and the Holy Spirit, and they stoned him to death with the Apostle Paul there witnessing it, I believe that's the time that God turned from Israel in terms of his special work through them and turned to drawing out the church, which we see in the book of Acts. And he began to now work through the individual Jews and Gentiles in the United States, in Israel, all over the world. And that is his plan right now, not working through Israel specifically, but through all people. When the church is finished and we're taken up out of the way in the rapture, then he is going to turn on the tribulation, especially for Israel, to purify her and to bring her forth in faith in Christ. And then in the millennium, once again, he's going to turn to Israel and give her all the promises of the Old Testament, all the blessings. And those blessings in large part apply to all of us because they're the blessings of God. Of course, the blessings on the land itself will be for the nation of Israel. But that's how God sees Israel, I believe. He goes on to say now, in closing here in verse 7, the works of his hands are truth, justice. All his precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people. Oh, he has redeemed us. He has redeemed us by the blood of Jesus Christ. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Oh, don't ever take his name in vain. When that hammer hits the thumb, find out oh, something else to say, sassafras or whatever you have to, but don't take his name in vain. Um, and then finally, verse 10, 
The fear of the Lord. Read that verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. The fear of the Lord. To fear him, to revere him, to obey him. That's the beginning of wisdom. It's not how many degrees you have after your name, what schools you go to. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not the wisdom that God is talking about. It's the wisdom of knowing him and knowing his word. And a good understanding have all those who do his commandments. Not just know them, but do them. And his praise endures forever. And that verse ends Psalm 111 and will begin Psalm 112, which we're going to cover in our next program. And so Kelly's going to close us out now in prayer. And we'll come back in a few moments and continue with Psalm 112. Thank you, Father. We know that you are um, a great God. You are the only true creator and father of this universe, our God. We love you, Father. We praise you. We thank you for what you've taught us tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. God bless you. Until the next time, shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom. Tonight, let's take our Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to the book of Psalms, Psalm 112, the blessings of the righteous. This is a psalm that talks about the blessings of fearing the Lord. We're going to see the blessedness that the righteous enjoy, the blessings that they enjoy, and then the anxiety of the wicked, those who do not know the Lord and do not love him. Righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ, to all who believe, according to Paul in Romans chapter 3, verse 22. The blessings of the righteous. Kelly's going to open us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you, Lord, and help us, Lord, tonight as we hear this psalm, Psalm 112. Help us to be encouraged to live righteous. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen and amen. In our previous program, we finished with uh, verse 10 of Psalm 111. And uh, these are companion songs, companion psalms. Uh, Psalm 111 talks about the righteous works, the marvelous works of God. And uh, Psalm 112 parallels that, talking about those who are righteous and how blessed they are when they do his commands. So the closing verse of Psalm 111, I'm going to have Kelly read that, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's when you really become wise. When you fear the Lord, you honor him, you obey him. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. It's not enough just to read the word, but you need to do the word. And then his praise endures forever. Now in our psalm for for tonight, Psalm 112, I'm going to have Kelly read uh, the, the 10 verses here, and then we're going to talk about those. Blessed is the man who, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He will not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. He is dispersed abroad. He is given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted with honor. The wicked will see it and be grieved. He will gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. So here we see the blessings of the righteous, those who love the Lord, who do his commandments. In the New Testament, we understand that to mean a personal faith in Jesus Christ. And in Psalm 112, we begin with the familiar praise the Lord or hallelujah. And again, that's a word that is used in every language. No matter what that language is, hallelujah is the same. 
And it's kind of God's way of getting us prepared to go before the throne because folks from all over the world are going to be there and uh, hallelujah is going to be a universal language, a universal word. Well, blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Now, the word blessed is a wonderful word. It has a great sense of uh, solemnity and uh, of strength and power. You know what the word really means? It means happy. We want to be happy. I'm not happy, people say. Well, uh, when you're blessed, you're happy. And when you're walking with the Lord and trusting in Him and fearing in Him, you're going to be happy. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in His commandments. Now, the word fear, it doesn't mean we have to walk around shaking, waiting for the other shoe to drop, although the word uh, in the Hebrew does indicate to be afraid. And it's kind of like in the New Testament. Some commentators are afraid to talk about the word fear, and they say, well, it doesn't mean fear, it means reverence. Well, it really means yeah. both. Um, in the New Testament, the word in the Greek is phobos, and they use the word phobia. That's not just reverence, that's also fear. So it's much like it was in my household. I don't know about your household, but my mother was the one who pretty much ran the house. And uh, when I obeyed, and I was good, I revered her, I honored her. When I disobeyed, and I was uh, at times doing that, it wasn't reverence, it was plain out and out fear. And so it is with God. You do right and you revere him. You do wrong and you're gonna be afraid. So he says, blessed or happy is the man who fears the Lord. And how do you do that? By you delighting greatly in his commandments. You delight in them, and we close the verse 10 of Psalm 111 by saying you do them. You do them, and you delight in them. Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commandments. Keep my commandments. Same thing, if you, that shows the love. When you sin, and we all do, another way of saying is, oops, Lord, I just kind of didn't love you then, did I? I love you, but I didn't love you in that sense because I disobeyed you. Please forgive me. Help me to love you more consistently. Well, let's talk about the blessings of the righteous. Verse 2, let's read that again, dear. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. So when you're blessed, do you have children? Do you have grandchildren? Do you want them to be mighty on the earth? Do you want them to be blessed and happy? Then live for the Lord. And when you live for the Lord, you also will share that faith with others. Kelly has done all that she's known to do uh, in raising six children. I came into her life only nine years ago, and so these were not my children, um, although I enjoy the blessing of having them in the family. But she has done all she can to take them to church, to speak to them. She works with her grandchildren. And um, the grandkids now uh, want for her to come on upstairs and pray with them before they go to sleep, and of course rub their backs, they like that too. But they, they want to have grandma pray for them. And um, I've seen their prayer lives develop over the last several years. Um, so teach your kids about the Lord. It's the greatest gift you can give them. Now wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Wealth and riches, it doesn't mean you're gonna be necessarily the wealthiest person around. You're gonna have all that you need. How much is enough? All of your needs, not only for yourself, but also for every good work. The Apostle Paul talked about that. Uh, what is ideal is when you give generously, sowing and reaping, you're going to have enough for your needs, and you should have enough for every other good need that comes your way. You know, helping to get the gospel out, bringing your tithe into the church, your offerings for different missions and ministries, helping the poor when necessary. So just having enough for yourself is not God's plan, but to have enough for yourself and also to help others as well. Wealth and riches will be in his house and his righteousness endures forever. You'll be righteous forever. You'll never lose your salvation because salvation is a gift from God. It's a gift through the blood of Jesus Christ. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. Oh, that's important, isn't it? For those who are upright, the world seems dark at times, doesn't it? We talked about that earlier this evening. It seems very, very dark. But light comes upon the scene. And what did Jesus say about light? He said, I am the light of the world. 
And he said, you also are going to be light because of the light that's in us through Christ. And you and I become that light in the darkness. And as it gets darker, what happens to that light? It shines brighter, doesn't it? It shines brighter. They told the soldiers, the uh, American soldiers in World War II, not to even light a cigarette when they were near the enemy, that a cigarette could be seen for several miles away. Wow. Uh, and so uh, a light in the dark place, I don't care how dark it gets, you let your light shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. People will see it. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. He's gracious. Get up tomorrow morning and say, Lord, thank you for being gracious. Thank you for being uh, uh, compassionate, for being righteous to me, Lord. I appreciate it. Well, what are the evidences of being righteous? Verse 5. A good man, a good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. So one of the evidences that you have when you are righteous is that you have enough uh, for your needs and you deal graciously with others and uh, sometimes you lend as the Lord leads but uh, be careful, make sure that it's of the Lord and that um, and, uh, and if you don't get paid back <laughs> that's something you have to work on. We all have to work on that, don't we? We've all uh, Lent, uh, especially in the families. And, and the kids love to say, can I borrow? Now, again, I never raised children. She's got six of them and she's got grandkids. What does that mean? I, don't have, I have no idea what that means. Can I borrow? What does that mean uh, as far as paying back? <laughs> A good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. The affairs of your life need to be with discretion, to be carefully discreet, carried out, and that means laid out before the Lord and guided and directed by the Lord. Surely he will never be shaken. When you walk with Christ and your affairs are in his hands, you're not going to be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. They're going to remember you forever and ever, not here on earth necessarily, but in heaven. Here on earth, they'll, they'll forget about you or me, in about three generations. Your kids will know you, your grandkids will know you, your great-grandkids will know, probably know your name. After that, probably not at all. That's it. That's about it. It's true. Um, it's but true. in heaven, it'll be forever. It'll be forever, and your name will be there forever and ever and ever. Uh, and what you've done for the Lord, your rewards, your crowns. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He will not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. When, you, when you're walking with the Lord, you're not going to be afraid of evil tidings. What kind of evil tidings are we talking about? They could come in any form. Medical report, financial report, relationship situation, um, pandemics, all kinds of things in this world can come. Kelly starts off her day every day with Psalm 91, protecting herself against the pestilences and the attacks and the evil reports and affairs of, of this world. Um, but you're not going to be afraid of evil tidings because your heart is steadfast and you're trusting in the Lord. That's the connection. If you're not trusting in the Lord, then you'll be afraid. But fear and faith cannot exist together, can they? Either you're in fear or you're in faith. If you're trusting in the Lord, that's faith and there's no fear. His heart is established. He will not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. Well, in the Old Testament, they were worried about their enemies and they cursed them, wanted to defeat them. If we have somebody who's an enemy in our lives, we're supposed to pray for that individual. We're not talking about a national attack like Hamas against Israel. That's, enemies have to have force met with force unless you're a pacifist. Um, but we're talking about enemies in your own life. It can be the devil. It can be uh, uh, the enemies of another person, your own thoughts. Um, 
God's going to give you the victory in every one of those areas that you trust in Him. Amen. Now, here's a quote. My Bible does not give a cross-reference, but I'll, I'll give you one in just a minute. Let's read verse 9 and 10. He is dispersed abroad. He is given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted with honor. The wicked will see it and be grieved. He will gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. Now, the righteous person is going to be generous. Verse 9, he has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. And the Apostle Paul picks up that quote in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. He's getting a gift together for the poor, the starving in Jerusalem. And he's encouraging the Corinthian church to be generous in their giving. In addition to your tithes, bring in an offering for the poor. There are three kinds of giving. There's the tithe, which is the 10% that really is a returning that to the Lord. There's offerings over and above that in helping God to get the word out worldwide. And then there's alms for the poor. And he's talking about the kind of giving we should have in 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6. He talks about the cheerful giver. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who, bount who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, or of ne in a necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he is dispersed abroad, he is given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. So there's that quote from Psalm 112 that we're considering here. And that when you're giving, whatever form of giving it is, uh, you're to sow, <coughs> excuse me, bountifully, not uh, sparingly. Uh, much like grass seed. I've got some bare spots uh, here at the church and also at home where uh, some grass seed needs to be applied, if not now, in the springtime. And uh, I have a decision to make on how I want to sow that area. You've all sown seed. You've got a patch. It could be a matter of a couple of yards by a couple of yards. And you can take one seed and put it here and measure whether it's the ruler 12 inches and put another seed there. And uh, what are you going to have? <laughs> not much. Not much. You get a couple of stalks and that's about it. Or you can sow generously and you're going to have a good harvest of seed. So it is financially. And it's going to be a fulfillment. Notice verse 8, he says, God's able to make all grace abound toward you. All grace, not just financial. That you always having all sufficiency in all things. God, first of all, wants to take care of you. That's not the end, but that's the beginning. He wants all your needs met. How much is enough? Everything that you need. But you're going to have also an abundance for every good work. Because God wants to get the gospel out around the world. And guess what? That costs money. That costs effort. People and uh, salaries and what have you. Verse 9, and he quotes, he, he has dispersed abroad, given to the poor, and the righteousness, the remembrance in heaven, is going to endure forever. Somebody once said, you can't take it with you. But you send it on ahead. But you can send it on ahead. And you can't take your money with you, but you can send it on ahead by the good investment that you have here on earth in kingdom work. Whatever money you put into the kingdom through your tithes, your offerings, and your alms are remembered in eternity. What about mercy? Now, that's another thing. You can go beyond the area of mercy of money. Mercy. You sow mercy, you're going to receive mercy. It's going to be bountiful. The rewards are in heaven. Grace, your time, your care, your compassion... There are those who have empathy, they listen to you, and they're concerned about you and concerned for you. Uh, that's a treasure, isn't it? So it's not just financial, it could be any of the wonderful blessings of God. You invest them in others, and you'll bless them, and the story's going to be told in heaven of what you did. Now, notice what happens when you do give. It blesses everybody. Verse 10 now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. While you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. When you give, 
You give to somebody, that person thanks God. God is blessed, verse 12. That's where we get that from when someone gives us a gift or whatever, we have a blessing. Just, I just got a new car and I thank the Lord. Yeah, I got to pay for it and I have to make all those payments. But I thank the Lord he's enabled me to do that. You know what I mean? And so and that's why I'm thanking the Lord. That's why I gave the praise, not to say, oh, I got a new car. But I felt like I have to praise the Lord for that because he's still behind it. He's behind every good gift comes from God. So notice what happens when you give. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints. When you give, you're supplying the need of the saint. But is also abounding through many thanksgivings to God. That person's thanking God and you're thanking God. So the, the, the person is blessed. God is blessed. Well, through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. And by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be to God for his inde indescribable gift. So when you give, you're blessing the person you're giving to. That person thanks God and God is praised and blessed. And they pray for you and give gratitude for you, and you are blessed by their prayers. And it all is tied up in that last verse. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And who is that? Jesus Christ. It all comes back to Jesus. And so we close this psalm uh, with this dispersing abroad, giving to the poor, righteousness enduring forever. Your strength, your horn will be exalted with honor. You'll be blessed in, in the, around the throne. The wicked will see it and be grieved. He will gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. So those who are unbelievers are going to see how you're blessed. And that's going to be a conviction for them, either to come to Christ or to perish. So wonderful psalms about uh, God's marvelous works and about the blessings of the righteous. So let's close in prayer, shall we, dear? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings, the psalm about the blessings of the righteous. We ask that we would live righteous and that you would see us as righteous as we obey you and do what is right. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen and amen. And may we experience the blessings. Yes, indeed. moment your needs to supply